let's talk through the the growth and kind of the market opportunity. And this is a different look at and in, in dollars at the growth of a company. So how do you start to see this? Well, we all know, right, the the smaller company, you're doing about a million bucks, three million bucks. It, this is really looking at the market opportunity as opposed to uh, dollar count. It's the same kind of concept, right, where everything is about a tripling um, tripling of dollar value as opposed to a tripling of headcount, where you go from a million dollars to three million, 10, 30, 100, and then 300 million up. Uh, so looking at it in that direction, if we start on the basically on the left hand side, right, you can see on the slide that uh, in the beginning, when you're at that million dollars, things are very simple, which is great because that's what you need, but they tend to be inconsistent, right? David, you talked earlier about the thumbs up, thumbs down. You don't normally always get the same thumbs up for the same process because the same, you know, it's it's a conversation between two people. It's kind of how I'm feeling at the moment. It works, but it can be very inconsistent. So as we move across, as you move into the larger dollar volumes, the system does get more complex, but it is also significantly more consistent because we have now... Uh, just like we were talking, working through those workflows, you go back and you look at the workflow, you go through and see what the next step is. The next step is you're no longer telling people you just have to be financially better, right? You're actually helping them find some of those capabilities that go with it. And this is where it all does absolutely begin and end, right? All the good, all the bad on a job begins or in a company begins and ends with talent. And so as you work your way through, uh, depending on where you are, is it a million bucks? Is it 10 million bucks? Is it a hundred million bucks? But as you continually work through the uh, talent value stream with your planning and through all of the stages that follow planning, you'll see that the profitable growth will follow as you move from the inconsistencies of, of your current process, right? Thumbs up, thumbs down. And as you work through more uh, processes, systems, uh, programs, guidelines, that you will become more consistent. And as you get more consistency, your profit growth will follow. So um, we just see it as the talent value stream continues. It's just used in a much different way. Again, like we were talking kind of the stages of growth. They're used in a much different way in a million dollar organization than it is in a thirty million dollar organization. All the thoughts are there, but we're we're applying it in a in a little bit different manner. So, David, other thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. The, uh, just the the that profitable growth will follow if you're intentional about developing the talent. Sure. And, I, and I was, I was th and, it, and it looks like a power curve because. It's really slow in the beginning, and I, I was actually thinking about two two people that are now at the the vice president level in a, in a company. But when but five years ago, they were both in like a, a project engineer roles, and then they but because there was such intentional development, we weren't trying to go make sure that the the project engineer function on the job was done. We were trying to take all of the project engineers and develop them a, a really deep, robust set of skills. And so there was a, a kind of an overinvestment, if you, you want to say. The investment was in the, what you would say the development side. We definitely were training and managing to build the projects they were on, but there was intentional development, you know, towards the future. And, you know, out of that group, you know, from five years ago, I'm trying to think where, where all of them are at. I know two of them are at a VP of operations level and each with a $100 million span in control. So they went from being project engineers on projects that were 10 to $15 million each, which are, you know, sizable enough projects, but now they're, they're each running a hundred million dollars plus of total business, but it's because they were very intentionally developed. Now, you know, with the growth of the company, they were probably over accelerated a little bit into those roles, but they're doing, they're doing fine because they've learned how, you know, the disciplines of working through the learning curve and everything. And so the, the growth curve looks exponential, but it, it starts with investing in the talent. It's not, you can't just check the box and put in your time and then your growth curve looks like this. You, you have to really invest in the talent because it becomes multipliers and they are now doing 
downstream, you know, within their teams, they are doing the same thing that was done to them. They're, they're emulating, you know, that they're over investing in their project engineers and that, the beginning entry level talent. So, so yeah, that's, that's the only thing I've got to add to that. So planning example, we, you touched on this, right? So stay, you know, planning your talent needs at stage one, you're just kind of starting up. Would you say like, I, I need someone to help me build this job I just got. And that's, and I know, I know a person, yeah, I, <laughs> I know my cousin, Vinny. I know a guy who knows a guy. <laughs> I know a guy who knows a guy. And, and there's, that's exactly where you should be at that point in time, right? I mean, you started the business because you knew how to build, you had a customer that was, was willing to go pay you for it. And you knew, knew a few mm-hmm. people that you'd worked with before. And, and that is your talent value stream at that point in time. And that is your planning. And you can't really, you know, do things like over invest in talent. Well, because you don't have any money because you just started up. That that is the nature of starting up. Right. So by the time you you progress forward now and you're maybe at stage four, you are you're looking at it and you've got really good control of your work in progress um, schedule. You've got good control of your opportunity pipeline. You're doing projects that are large enough so you have pretty good visibility in the six to 12 month time frame, looking ahead, just based on the runoff of your, your project backlog. And so you can look forward and say, all right, we need three more PMs this year. And we have one project engineer that's, that's ready to go promote. So we, but we still need to bring in two outsiders. And so you, you can start to look at your talent that way. And you are probably just starting to experiment with a, a little bit better management of outside recruiters and right. you're still very frustrated with them because they are it is it's a frustrating thing to manage if you are not really good at managing right. it so that's that's about where you're at at stage four now you move up to uh, stage six plus and now you're really looking and you're using some big words here it's so like based on our business planning and our market forecast where we were looking at this market i mean that, that was you know, yesterday we were going through long-term forecast for and in you know market indicators for the the three markets that the contractor competed in. We have certain known retirements coming up. We have historical turnover rates. We just know that we're going to lose. A, so it's not a desired thing, but you know, one or two of our people are going to leave no matter what. So we need an additional twenty-three project managers in the next five years. And then based on our current pipeline of talent, um, the, those that have potential and career progression timelines, we will need 20 interns to accept full-time offers for project engineers this year. And then that gets into, that, that was a yesterday conversation as the, the recruiter was going through there and going, okay, this is what we're going to do in 2024 for college recruiting, yeah. you know, with 2023 is already, you know, set this is what we need to up our game to in 2024. And it, and it, in this company, it's still pretty, you know, management intensive. So the recruiter, though, he knows what to go do. He still has to go leverage all of the other managers and get them to go commit their time and everything like that, which I thought was pretty cool because he's not, but he's planning ahead and he's going, okay, guys. And you know, we're, we're in 2023, we're getting into busy season. We're just going to, you know, this is going to, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. But when we get into 2024, you know, this is where I want to start committing our resources and our calendars to. So it was, it was perfect. And then additionally, we have to identify at least, you know, 20 craft or foremen that are interested in moving into that PE tract over the, over the next two years. So you, cause you might be pulling in, depending on the company, pulling in people from, you know, several sources, either the college track or the field track into the PE role. So, so that's what it looks like at these different stages in planning and, and just, I think, you know, we, we talk about it. Remember that every stage is appropriate for the stage, you know, the stage of growth. It, it's only if you tried to do the stage six process when you're at stage one, you're not going to have a customer tomorrow because you forgot to build the project. <laughs> <laughs> and, if you're, and if you're still going hand to mouth at stage four, you quite simply just need too many people. And so you're just constantly reacting and it just won't work out. So it's just really important to align, you know, where you're at, just know where you're at. and and. uh align it thoughts uh, any anything additional this was just building upon what you'd already said or do you want to dive into recruit to hire uh no i think uh i i think this is a great base and this yeah absolutely leads us right into the recruit to hire okay so here we are we've got a talent shortage <laughs> <laughs> you know i we we haven't 
it's funny. We have a talent shortage in a, in a couple of ways, right? We actually have a shortage and we have an image problem. So, um, yeah, there's a talent shortage all over the place, right? Well, which is why we have to find new ways, right? We have to find uh, out-of-the-box ways. We have to be ahead of the game um, to find that talent. And, and just like this quote says, right, not just any talent, but the best talent. Because some people, they, if they don't want to be in construction, that's fine. Let's find the best talent that works for us and not just um, finding the, you know, the person off the street. So. So, so I pulled some metrics, um, and and these are not. I mean, this is just how brutal it, you know, things are in the the industry, yeah. and it, and it's super interesting. Like I remember, you know, when I started in the construction industry, and I went down and I tried to to um, go get into the the apprenticeship program, uh, eighty eight, eighty nine, or something. Yeah, I just I couldn't get in. They just weren't taking any more people. All fold up. <laughs> you know, we don't we don't have any more room. You know that, and and that's totally different now. Mm -hmm. These were some metrics. Um, just these were actual metrics for craft recruitment, and it was this is kind of breaking down the recruit to hire process. So there's like you know, put in the broad category of sourcing activities, right? There's the social media advertising, job postings you know, actual outreach, you know, recruiting, there's referrals from, from people coming in. So there's all these sourcing activities that go on, which you, you know, you have to define those, you know, within your company and for each stage of growth and each type of role, but they, they needed 50 applicants coming in. And this, this was a, uh, you know, craft and they were going from journeyman through, through apprentice level. And so 50 applicants coming in and then they were, you know, managing that and saying what, you know, kind of metrics, what's the cost per applicant? What, how many hours did we have to invest in it? What were the best sources? Where were we getting people from? Out of those 50, um, 18 of them were kind of good enough to be phone screened, 36%. 6%, six of those, uh, one third of those after the phone screening were still both interested in the job and then came in to be tested. They, they actually ran through some craft testing, you know, type of things just to make sure that righty tighty was, was known and lefty Lucy and all those things. And they could, they could do the work safely and, and stuff like that. So they'd actually built out a testing center, which we're seeing more and more of. And then out of those six, um, four of them, past that hurdle and then you know went to the next stage where they were interviewed by the in this case superintendents and then out of those four that were interviewed about two of them make it through to be do the onboarding process and and then you know once you know it's great you know okay good you did good in the test lab you interviewed good but then when you actually get out onto the job site and it's 110 degrees or you know minus 10 degrees or whatever it is you know conditions change right. once you're out on the job site and, you, and you're seeing how things really really work and so only about one out of two of those were a kind of a keeper after two weeks on the job and that just happened to be the condition different markets are going to be different different companies are going to have slightly different metrics but this this uh, stack of metrics is not unusual for for this and if you're if you're going to, if you're union if you're non-union you are managing this process if you're non-union the the union is managing this process but we've also seen lots of times where the union is just simply out of people right. and so then the contractor has to work with them and take on responsibility for running this process and then organizing people in so it doesn't matter whether you're union or non-union and then yeah, that's it is what it is. So, so anyhow, these are these are pretty daunting level metrics, like a fifty to one ratio, huh? Well, and I tell you, depending on you know, th this is for craft. When you start looking at others, uh, you're lucky to get fifty applicants. You're probably getting five applicants, right? So the 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 rate is better, right? <laughs> but but there's a lot less a uh, yeah. lot less of a pool to look at. Um, and you still get down to, you know, maybe onboarding two and hoping one is a keeper. So. And, and then the reason it's important, and we're going to switch to looking, this is a micro view yeah. of, of a particular job, a role in a particular company. And when you look at it like a funnel, you got to realize like if your applicant, you know, portion goes down, if you're only getting 30 applicants, Wow, what, what do you have to do? What has to be true? You could you could hope that all thirty of them are perfect and they're all keepers, and that. But hope's generally not a good strategy. So, 
you you might have to do something to entice see why people are falling out of the funnel what is it your pay rate that is just yeah. not not right so do you offer an extra you know buck an hour or something like that or do you do you raise that do you raise some benefits or perks to maybe take that 36 percent on phone screen take it up to 50 percent or do you lower your standards or a combination of the two but there's only a few levers you can pull when your supply is low there, there's very few levers that you can go pull and we'll, we'll talk about those so so now macro viewpoint this this gets into the talent shortage piece so macro viewpoint first of all starts with the total quantity of people and total quantity of people that are that are out there that's been there is a, a massive decline in birth rates between 1960 and 1975, like, like a 25% decline went from something like four and a half million, you know, births per year to like three and a half million. So it was a massive decline for 15 years, except for summer of 69. So, <laughs> and I know we've, we've got another one of those coming up and then. And then you've got to look at some foundational skills. Like one of the things, like I grew up in a rural area, like I, I came up through the field from a, a craft level, but I grew up in a, in a small mountain town where literally there was three houses in the, the little town that I lived in. And we had a party line, you know, phone wise, that's where you pick it up and you can hear all your neighbors. And you're like, Oh, sorry. And you <laughs> hang back up. And, you know, so it was small. So I grew up using tools and cutting myself and doing harm to myself literally since I was three or four years old. So by the time I got into construction at 15, I didn't have, there was no questions about how to go use tools, how to figure things out, how to cut things, bolt things together, do all of that. Whereas that looks a lot different. So between 1970 and 2020, 38% of the people that were living in those rural areas, like I was, they, they've migrated to urban areas. And there, there's no way that you get, like, my daughter does not have any of those. She just didn't have those same experiences. You know, we, we're not in the woods. We're not cutting down trees to go make fire for ourselves. We have, we have gas. <laughs> you know? It's like piped into the house, you know, put in by a contractor. Um, so so that, that definitely changes when, you know, uh, kids going into an apprenticeship program today look very, very different than kids going into an apprenticeship program 20 or 30 years ago. Which then also brings you down to they've got to be interested in construction. So um, emphasis on vocational tracks in high school started getting pulled away in the 60s as we started you know, pushing for more managerial type roles, larger companies, computer sciences, things like that. And then funded, there was some changes in the 80s and 90s that dramatically cut shop classes. They, they cut the funding for shop classes. So you know, that's kind of the macro view. Well, that's your first 18 to 20 years of life. Now you've got four to eight years of, you know, specific technical training and on the job experience before you're, you're going to be decent at what you do. So now maybe you're, you know, 22 to what, 28 years old or 26 years old. I'm going to have trouble with the math here as I go <laughs> through these, but, you know, so somewhere, you know, by the time I've, I've learned this on the job, just technical, how to do things, I'm somewhere, you know, I'm probably 22 to 28 years old by that point in time when I'm, I'm really pretty good at that. Then we can start moving into some direct management roles, you know, supervising some people. And it's going to take me some time to build depth of experience at that level. And then if we want to get up into these really super big, large, complex projects, it may take me, you know, 15 years to get a lot of experience as a really good project manager or a superintendent running those, those jobs because they have longer cycles and I've got to get several of them under my belt be, before I've, you know, you know, it was, I saw this definition of an expert. It was uh, an expert is somebody who has made just about every mistake that, that could be made in a very narrow field. <laughs> <laughs> and so now they, they know what, what to go do. And so when we're looking at those superintendents and those project managers and those estimators that, that kind of go after those really big complex projects, yeah, most of them happen to be in their, their mid forties or so, just because it simply takes that long to mm -hmm. build that depth of experience, which gets us back to the declining birth rates between 1960 and 1975. So we were we have this massive gap in the 45 to 65 year olds coming up. It's not just, you know, as baby boomers was the definition before, but it, but it's really this 45 to 65 year old um, age range. And we have this massive gap that we kind of peaked at in 2015. And it's just a long downhill slide um, to 2030. So this is not going to get better. 
And that's, um, then you move up into your areas like functional area management, like who is the head of all field operations or the head of all accounting and finance or the head of all estimating or project management. And though that becomes an even smaller group of people that have the desire and the capabilities to be able to do it. Plus it takes experience and you, you can have desire and aptitude all you want, but without experience, it doesn't really do any right. good. And then you're, you're moving up beyond that into those general management roles. So, so that's where we see, you know, p- people really, you know, contractors really getting bottlenecked is saying, okay, we just don't have enough, you know, we don't have a, an ops manager, so it's hard to scale. And because we don't have a really good ops manager, we don't have the ability to really train our PMs and our PEs very well. Um, so, so anyways, this is kind of the macro viewpoint of the talent shortage that you were talking about earlier. Any, uh, <laughs> Any words of wisdom on how to navigate this one? Well, I tell you, the, the best thing you can do is look at the talent value stream in such a way that how do you maximize each and every piece of the talent value stream, right? If we're doing really good planning and we really understand what our recruit to hire is and we really look at the offboarding, now you've got you know the onboarding and the retention piece that you, you really have something to work with there. Because just like you said, if the top of the funnel continues to get smaller, we need to find ways to keep people inside our pipeline and not have to just go out and find new people to come into the pipeline. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's bleak, but not insurmountable, right? We just have to look at it in new ways. Right. So. But, but yeah, and the, and the good news is it's an industry wide problem, right? Yeah. So not it's not like there's one contractor that has the right. market cornered on talent right. and they're all running there. So everybody's dealing with the same thing. So it's a matter of if you can deal with it ten percent better than I can deal with it, you're going to have a competitive right. advantage. Fair fair statement. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. 